Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, folks, to this week's Tuesday podcast. <clears throat> Let's see how long it takes for the Facebook notification to go out this time. Yeah, I'm still waiting on mine. I'm, I'm watching. I'm watching. <laughs> watching. Yeah, I mean, you, is YouTube slow. is just flawless. It's just like, boom. So I, I can see the post, but I haven't still gotten a, a notification yeah. on it. That that's that's what it's been doing, dude. Like, it uh, the, you you can totally see the post. You'll see the video right there and everything. But the notification, I think, like doesn't even. I think it almost like rolls out because some people will seem to get it sooner, and other people get it later. Yeah. See, like right now, we we got Facebook people coming in. Hey, Facebook peeps, <laughs> which must which most likely means they got notified. Yeah. But I have not. Neither have I. It's a grand mystery of yeah. Facebook live streaming. <laughs> Facebook's trying to suppress us, y'all. <laughs> Stick to the man. Hey, Everest. <clears throat> Very cool. There it is. I just got notified. So maybe go. now all of a sudden we see a flood of people. <laughs> hey, Robert Johnson on YouTube. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, you know what? I, I can only, it's hard for me. I like the fact that we can get uh, YouTube comments as well, but mm -hmm. it's hard to like go back and forth and <laughs> message each one. I wish there was a way to, you know, not not uh, ignore one or the other. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I wish that the uh, comments here, so folks, you don't know what we see because we're in this StreamYard is the program uh, interface. And uh, what, what's great about it is it allows us to broadcast to both places. It allows us to, it, it, it compiles all your comments from both YouTube and Facebook into one interface, which is great. And we can choose to comment to either Facebook or YouTube or both, which is also really cool. But I can't reply to people directly, right? Uh, I can't. Um, see like emojis and stuff like that. Well, I guess some emojis, like so the smiley face there I saw, but there's some things that people, oh, uh, gifts and memes and stuff that sometimes people send. We don't see that stuff. So you just keep all those gif images and memes to yourself, all right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> just teasing. <clears throat> <Very cool. laughs> Brad's all excited because he can watch us on his TV. Oh, neat. Yeah. <laughs> I just figured that out too with the whole <clears throat> streaming thing with uh with my daughter's classes and stuff. Sometimes they send a link and say, I want you to watch this and instead of I figured out how to stream it to the TV to the Roku thing. So nice. Super high tech, man. <laughs> Hello, April. Thanks for watching. And Rob Beckman joining us on YouTube from Ohio. Rob Beckman, host of the Firearm Trainers podcast. Nice. Yeah. Always a pleasure to have uh, Rob with us. Today is our news and gear reviews episode for the month. Uh, we've got a lot of interesting news stories to cover today. Kind of a wide-ranging uh, area of subjects. or Yeah, subject. A bunch of different subjects. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> wide range of subjects. Deal. That's what I was trying to say. And uh, yeah, plus a couple of reviews. I'm going to be reviewing. Oh, snap. I left it over there i will go retrieve that just in a moment but i'll be reviewing the wilson combat p320 grip module uh pretty interesting you and have yeah i do mm -hmm. I, I bought it too like i didn't even i didn't i didn't use my <laughs> highfalutin concealed carry.com credentials and say will you send me one of those for review <laughs> i just said take my money here you go i gotta have it um it wasn't terribly expensive I also have just recently, and this is a courtesy and gift from Mike Grasso from Grey Guns. And Mike uh, is in my thoughts and prayers. He's uh, been uh, fighting cancer again and, and, and going through some things there, had surgery and stuff. Uh, and he dumped uh, some of his kind of like leftover or spare or extra, um, just various things. And uh, I was able to pick up one of the original Grey Guns laser stippled p320 modules the full size cool. one i don't have any full size slides except for an x5 which i'm sure it'll look great with but uh yeah it was just you know i thought i gotta have one of those 
it's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, for sure. But anyway, we hope that uh, Mike, uh, you know, continues to heal and, and recover uh, very quickly. Stand by while I grab that Wilson Combat. And you can tell people, you can tease them what you're going to review. Yeah, I'm going to prep you guys. Normally, I try to pick something new. and uh, But I'm going to go back kind of something that I've been using for a long time. And I think that you guys might have one. You might not. I don't know. I'm not going to tell you like Riley. I'm not going to spill it out yet. But uh, it's something you may have had. You've probably seen it. Uh, but it's something that I bring to the range every single time I go, and uh, I use it quite a bit. So that's what I'm going to be talking about for my little review. All I heard was, and I bring it to the range every time I go, and mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah. I love it, love it, love it. That's all I heard. I'm just teasing. Yeah, I didn't tell him what it is. <laughs> I'm not going to prep it that much. I'm trying to get this barrel block in this thing so people don't have to wonder. There we go. Wilson Combat Grip Module P320. Nice. We'll talk about it. <clears throat> All right. Well, let's uh, let's actually get into the recorded portion of today's show. Let's do it. All right. Here we go. In three, two, one. This is the Concealed Carry Podcast, episode number 407. And welcome to the Concealed Carry Podcast, part of the ConcealedCarry.com network. I'm your host, Riley Bowman. And I'm joined by Matthew Marister, yes, good old graybeard. <laughs> one day it's going to come off and I'm going to be so sad. Dude, I, when my wife, I, I'm going to wake up one day and it's going to be gone because my wife's going to shave it off while I sleep. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Oh. So, welcome to the show, guys. Today is our news and gear reviews episode. Uh, we do this once a month, and we cover industry news as well as gear reviews. A couple of picks between Matthew and I that we'll talk about. In fact, uh, we'll just tease a little bit. I'm going to talk about the new Wilson Combat P320 grip module. Pretty cool. Pretty, uh, pretty exciting to see something new and different in the realm of P320 modular grip modules. And then Matthew's going to talk about the Pig Lube Range Kit, yeah, yep, which yep. is also a it's a favorite of mine as well. So looking forward to getting into all of that. But also we are going to cover a bunch of industry news stories. Uh, we've got oh man, all kinds of different topics. We're going to talk about uh, the ATF and, and of course you know ATF's got to come into the picture, right? President Trump and. Gun, business, gun businesses being declared as essential. We're going to talk about some businesses helping out during COVID-19, this whole pandemic. We're going to talk about all kinds of stuff, so stay tuned. In fact, we'll even get into the whole Duncan Lemp thing. I don't know if, Matthew, if you saw I added that. I did. I think it's time. Mm -hmm. I think, well, at least to address some things. So we'll talk about it. <clears throat> but today's episode is brought to you by Laser app.com lasr app.com and their laser x software super awesome software that uh, i get to play around with and record things for people uh, in video form such as the shooter ready challenge yeah we're gonna talk about shooter ready challenge as well today in the this month's shooter ready challenge which is a good one and today's episode also brought to you by next level training.com and their cert pistol all right, which is, again, another favorite of mine. I've been using, you know, I've been, I was a pretty early adopter of the Laser app, the original application. I don't even, I don't even remember what version I was on, but it was a long, long, long time ago. Like, I think even before, well, I don't know, maybe it was version 2. Like, before the 2.1s and 2.2s, and it might have even been like one point something. I don't remember. It's going back a ways. But I've been using using Laser App for some time, and they have since created the Virtual Laser X version, which allows you to use any device. And that has been life-changing for me because now I use my iPad instead of a Windows-based laptop, which mm -hmm. Laser App, the original, was only compatible on. The Cert Pistol I've been using for... Golly, four or five years. Uh, no, it's been longer. It's been at least five years, I would say. So, big fan of Cert Pistol and Laser App together. Again, check out laserapp.com forward slash LASRX to learn more about LaserX and nextleveltraining.com. 
and we also sell the cert pistols on our store. We also sell licenses to the laser app software too. So you can check all that out in our store or go directly to their sites. Doesn't matter to me. We love them. We support them. We hope that you will too. All right. So speaking of shooter ready challenge, <clears throat> this month's shooter ready challenge, uh, you know, we we now highlight this uh, once a month in the, on the podcast as well. Uh, and so this month's shooter ready challenge is basically get, practicing the whole idea of, well, actually I'll start with, it's learning to draw your gun with your hands in non-standard locations, right? Because so often we will just kind of stand there with our hands at our sides. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? But uh, this this month's shooter rate challenge introduces the concept, the idea of, well, what if my hands were up here or here or here or there or whatever? And specifically, this this month's shooter rate challenge calls for drawing from the surrender position. Surrender position being like you've surrendered yourself. So uh, you you have your back basically towards your enemy or your target, and your hands are above your shoulders. Uh, kind of the classic, you know, like I'm about to be executed sort of thing, you know, right? Which, speaking of which, my wife and I were just watching that uh, new PBS Masterpiece show last night, War- World on Fire. Not too bad, not too bad. Pretty mm. pretty cool show. Uh, all about World War II. But anyway, so... Um, Drawing from the center surrender position, that is specifically the drill, but you'll note if you watch the Shooter Ready Challenge, available at ShooterReadyChallenge.com, uh, that I talk about, it's a good idea to practice drawing from a variety of different hand positions or locations. So introducing that concept, I think, is a worthwhile and valid one. I mean, what do you think, Matthew? Yeah, and I like in the video um, that you, you differentiate, you, you say... You know, this isn't necessarily a direct uh, contextual type scenario that we're playing, right? Like we're not teaching, hey, you're going to do some crazy Kung Fu, Jackie Chan thing, spin around, grab the, you know, the gun, (laughs) you know, disable it and take it apart before the guy knows what's going on. We're not talking about that, right? Like we're talking about building the skills to be able to uh, draw from with your hands in a different position than what you typically would and be able to kind of since because you start with your back to the to the threat to sort of flesh out or figure out how do I turn with the gun, get my, you know, pick up the threat and draw at the same time and present the, my gun to the target in, in a, you know, uh, a quick and um, efficient method. And I think that, you know, it's like one of those things where you, you, until you do it, you're like, oh, why do I need to do that? You know, I know how to draw, I know how to turn, I know how to, but when you start putting it all together, you start figuring out little things that take more time or make it easier. Um, and so I think, I think it's a, a good, now I'm glad you, you mentioned that because, you know, a lot of people will say, well, this is, this drill, how does it directly apply? Well, it's not like a scenario. It's, it's building a, a specific skill or a specific skill set. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You're right about that. And that, that is, that is always my thinking, you know, so often this, you know, we see the keyboard commandos online when they see a person doing some kind of shooting drill and like, well, that's, you know, that's fine on a flat range, but there's no applicability to being in a actual shooting or whatever. Well, that's, that's true, actually. Mm -hmm. Well, I shouldn't say there's no applicability, but there's no maybe direct applicability uh, that so many of the things we do are intended to develop certain skills or skill sets. And, uh, you know, what is realistic or what is more real world about something like this is, well, your hands may not always necessarily be in the same location, you know, at a nice, easy, relaxed, hands at the side position. So it's, it's, it's good to introduce other variables to that. And here's the other thing. With starting with your back to the target, it means that you don't get to start with your eyes on target. That changes things a little bit too. You got to f- come around, find that target, identify it, and then bring your gun up to that target and proceed to address the target. So so there's that as well I mean, because there's going to be a lot of scenarios too in, in the real world where something something has to you know get your attention first. Uh, whether it's a robbery, whether it's a gunshot, whether it's uh, a shout, whatever it is, and you got to go, whoa, what's going on? You've got to orient yourself to that, figure out the situation, and then determine how to act. Kind of the old 
OODA loop sort of thing. But anyway, so uh, yeah, I like this month's shooter ready challenge because again, yeah, it encourages all of those things. You don't you don't get this preconceived or really a, a rehearsed so so much. Uh, well, it's still rehearsed in a degree, and that's why I said in, the, in even in the shooter ready challenge, like this month's shooter ready challenge specifically says doing it from the surrender position. But then I also clarified as well and said, hey, it's a good idea to practice this from a variety of different positions. Uh, and, and so, and that's really what I want, want people to get at is, you know, switch things up, change the variables a little bit uh, and test yourself. You know, how does that affect you? Well, probably the first time you ever, like if all you've ever practiced is hands relaxed at side, draw a gun, the first time you come from a different position, it will be a little bit different. And if all you've ever done is started facing the target and staring at the target and like really locked in on that hit zone that you're going for, whatever it is, then all of a sudden you take your eyes off that target and you've got to turn, lock on, draw, and do all of that, it changes things. So uh, this is about beginning to introduces other variables and, and, and it starts helping you become a little bit more well-rounded of a shooter. And that I think is where it's at. Yeah, I agree. And, and you know, Jared makes a, uh, mentioned in, in the chat, he says carrying grocery bags and drawing is also a good drill not to get off in the weeds, but, um, that, that you're absolutely right. I mean, I wrote, I, I wrote an article like probably one of the first articles I wrote like five years ago about like trying to keep your, your dominant hand free and carry things in your non-dominant hand. If you have the, the, uh, you know, the wherewithal to think or ability to do that. And, uh, I remember a lot of people commenting and say, why don't you just, you know, carry it with any hand and just practice dropping it? Well, if you, not a lot of people practice with things in their hands, like, a, a, you know, uh, stuff in their hands and then drawing their gun. So all those little things that, you know, you'll see in the, in the drill, um, or in that drill, you can start thinking and expounding on it um, to make it more applicable. But the core of it is exactly what Riley said. You know, you, you're doing something that's probably applicable as far as turning and things like that. But, um, but you know, it, it's just a little bit of a wrinkle in what you normally practice. Yeah. You know, to to your point, you said not to get into the weeds, and but uh, you opened the door. So now I'm going to wander <laughs> out into those weeds a little bit. Uh, you know, this is something that I've actually been thinking about recently because I, I used to, you know, think, and I guess I should say I still do think pretty similarly in that when when I'm uh, out and about and I'm carrying something, like I try to carry it my support hand and leave my shooting hand available, right? Uh, you know, I've seen it tested and I've, I've not experienced it personally. I've not really had a problem with this even in high stress situations. But I've definitely seen it in other people that, you know, some some force on force uh, situations, classes and things I've been in, uh, some other things on the range, uh, including a basic uh, police qualification course of fire where you started with handcuffs in your support hand. Mm -hmm. And it was like the first stage in this qualification was, you know, on the signal, drop handcuffs, draw a gun. And sometimes you'd find those people that would just draw a gun and come up and realize, oh, handcuffs are in gun in my hand and then kind of like fumble and go, what do I do? Or then try to drop, drop, or some people would almost even not seem to be even aware. Like they would just sort of like bring the hands up with the handcuffs and meet the hands and proceed to shoot. So, um, now I've not had a problem with that personally, but I've thought about that for, for a number of years. Okay. All right. Carry my groceries in my left hand or whatever. Right. Um, but then I, I've been thinking more about it recently, and I don't have anything to back this up, and it's not something I've been able to test yet. So this is really just a theory at this point, but I, I'd be open to other people's thoughts and, and, and opinions, including yours, Matthew. And the thought was, well, what if I was carrying something in my shooting hand? Would I be more inclined to be like recognize that, hey, I can't use my gun with this in my hand, so I, I have no choice but to drop it? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like subconsciously, mentally, uh, uh, psychologically, would I be more inclined to drop that object that I don't need at that moment uh, to, because I'm forced to to go and grab my gun? I don't know. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I've never done any, you know, uh, data or can't, can't 
I can only talk about anecdotal stuff like you, you know, yeah. um, I've never done a, a research and I've never seen anybody actually do research, but it'd be interesting, um, to start getting a, a good, you know, sample base of, of students and just, you know, kind of go through it. And after you get a hundred students that have gone through it, um, various times, maybe, maybe start to see trends or maybe not no trends at all. Yeah. Well, yeah. So it's something I, I'd like to explore a little bit further. Mm -hmm. Uh, this idea of uh, particularly an object in your dominant hand. If anybody's aware of anybody that has tested or done some work on that, I would definitely like to know about that. Uh, and, and here's kind of my thinking as well. That and this will be where I where I leave it before we move into our first sto news story. Is that uh, my my muscle muscle memory, <laughs> right? In quotes. Uh, it is such that when I go for the gun on the draw, this hand starts open like this, open palm, right? Thumb's not perfectly straight with the with the uh, palm and the fingers. My thumb is is it's it's going to be kind of like this because that's prepping me to go right to the gun and index the way I typically do right on the gun. Okay, so that's that's what I have thousands and thousands of repetitions of practicing and doing. And that's why I wonder, well, if that's the so-called muscle memory, then uh, if I got something in my hand, would I not just instinctively, because this is what's been practiced, that that hand releases and goes into that open palm, ready to grab my gun type, you know, uh, position or whatever. So that's that's kind of my thinking. I don't know. It'd be interesting to, to test. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's see. First news story. The FireOnBlog.com reports Miami Beach Police Department to be equipped with APC 9K Pro SMGs from BNT. <laughs> that's a kind of a, a that's a fun bit of like acronyms there. APC is this uh, platform, all right? It's a basically a submachine gun platform, and that's SMG, so that's submachine gun for those that, that don't know or didn't catch that in the first reading of the title. Uh, and B&T is a company out of Switzerland that makes the APC-9. It, it's the APC because they actually make you, – you can get it in 9 millimeter, 40, uh, 45. Uh, they have a little bit longer versions, shorter versions. Well, this is the APC-9K. 9 millimeter is a very short platform version. Um, now, why is this note, noteworthy? Well, because I've shot these before, and they're pretty cool. Uh, they're actually a very smooth shooting sub comp, you know, sub machine gun sized platform, and I like them. I I, I think there's a lot of promise in them. The uh, the APC has uh, been chosen as the U.S. Army's official sub machine gun. Like they got a massive contract for that, so that is pretty cool. And uh, so apparently, we're starting to see some law enforcement agencies adopt these as well. Now, what's particularly noteworthy about this particular I said particular twice. Uh, APC 9K is that for the Miami Beach is that this is a P320 magazine cap uh, uh, capable or or you know it 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 fits the P320 magazines. Mm -hmm. I didn't know they made those, but I'll say I'll say this much about BNT. I've been rather impressed with how quickly and how willing they are uh, with adapting this platform, and some of that is because it is basically an upper and a lower receiver so that you know it's 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 modular kind of like an ar-15 is modular i mean a lot of folks don't realize that there's just just how uh, awesome a platform like an ar-15 even is as far as its modularity because of the fact you have an upper and a lower receiver the way you do the apc is similar uh in that you got those two different receivers so they can kind of make whatever they need to for the bottom Right, that's your magazine well. That's your mag catch, your mag release, all that stuff, and just fit that into an upper receiver with your your all of your other action bits and barrel and all that. So uh, anyway, check out B and T, and if you're interested, like I think they have some civilian models uh, available or soon to be available. Um, but uh, I think they're a pretty interesting platform. I enjoy shooting it. Yeah, I wish I had an opportunity to shoot it, but it looks pretty cool. Yeah, they had a very small booth at uh, Industry Day at the Range this year. Mm. 
Uh, so I, and I just happened to, to notice that and I was like, Ooh, I'm going to go get my hands on those. <laughs> I spent a good little while with, uh, with them and shooting them. And, uh, Sean Burroughs, uh, who's been on the podcast before, uh, he, he's actually a sponsored, uh, shooter with them now as well. Mm-hmm. So, so we had a good time. All right. Uh, let's see. Next up. ATF releases guidance, allowing firearm transi- transactions through drive up windows during pandemic. Have you been tracking this, Matthew? A uh, little bit. I, I mean, it kind of came on my radar, and it was one of those things where I figured it would get solved relatively quickly because it didn't seem like that difficult of a of an issue to to figure out. But obviously, you know, it, just from reading the the uh, the title, you can understand. But you know, basically, what happened was with the pandemic and things being shut down and not allowing um, certain businesses to be open for uh, you know customers to come into the store, right? So um, they were saying, well, what if we do social distancing and we are allowed to sell, you know, guns, uh, somebody comes up to, the, to to a window, similar like a, like a fast food type thing where we don't have to have a bunch of people inside the store. Um, we can service them maybe even outside where it's not in a closed space and maybe it's a little bit healthier that way. And because of, um, you know, strict regulations on how you or where you can sell firearms, right? Like if, if, if FFL has, uh, uh, the license to sell it, it pertains to, you know, their, their business, it, they can't sell it outside certain limitations out and typically it would be outside the the store, right? But um, there was no real guidance or no real specificity in that to say, you know, if you set up a table out in the parking lot is, of your business and you own the parking lot and everything, is that legal to sell guns from there? Um, so the the um, ATF just issued some guidance to say, yeah, you can do that, um, but it has to be, you know, uh, specifically owned by the company and things, just kind of common sense that you would expect. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, uh, this is kind of remarkable. I mean, so you had President Trump, and this is actually our next news story, so I'll just kind of merge these two together. Uh, The Trump administration comes out and says the gun industry is an essential business. Which is the right the right move, I think. Uh, I think that's that's a good play. Uh, I think with the current situation of things, uh, people are honestly right now people are at, a, at, at in some ways greater risk to some things, right? Um, you know, there's there's a greater likelihood of people encountering home intruders because more and more people are staying home more. Uh, I do think that probably home invasions have, I don't know for sure on this, but my, my perception is, as I kind of track and follow the news, uh, that there's probably fewer home invasions or home burglaries taking place right now, but they're not all gone. And as, as some people that really rely on that as sort of almost like a form of, you know, like that's their job, like there's, there's you know, guys out and gals out there that like, that's basically their living is go in, break into people's houses, steal stuff so they can get money, jewels, crap they can sell, whatever it is. So they can most most of the time buy drugs. Right. And so, uh, I suspect that that's gone down somewhat, but it doesn't go completely away. And because we have more and more people staying at home, then there's a greater likelihood that there's going to be people in the residence when these really desperate characters uh, decide to try to break in. And so uh, I would say, yeah, people have a right, obviously, to defend themselves. So, you know, maybe they didn't buy a gun before now. Maybe they didn't think they needed it. And for the first time in their life, they go, I think I need a gun. Yeah, it's an essential business for sure. Uh, So you have the ATF now that's like, well, wait a minute. We got businesses in states that are telling us their governors uh, have shut down things, and maybe that particular state has not declared them as an essential business. So there's this little bit of a state versus federal, you know, a little bit of a uh, of a conflict there as well. But hey, what? Wh- either way, like I got, we got to maintain social distancing, no matter what. And the Trump administration has been encouraging that, of course. So how do we manage this? How do we actually have people come into our stores and buy guns? And how do we maintain that social distancing? So that's where this came out of. And uh, it's kind of interesting. You know, you got basically got where the ATF has said, hey, if there's a way you can have a drive-through, hey, 
by all means. Uh, or if you want to set up a, a table outside, you know, where you're not in an enclosed space and you got a little bit more airflow and less likelihood that as we maintain, you know, six foot distance and all that, that we're outdoors, we're, we're going to be less likely to come in contact with uh, uh, aerosolized uh, body fluids and whatever stuff, you know, because people are coughing, sneezing, that sort of thing. Uh, so yeah, ATF says, yep, this is acceptable, but it's got to be on the business property. That's the one thing. And I've always thought it's a little bit funny, but that's the one thing about a FFL, uh, you know, a dealer's license, right? Is that you got to have a, you got to have a license that's attached to a specific address. It has to be a physical address. Mm -hmm. And if you have a, another address or another location for your business, it's, it's got, it's, it's got a whole other license. Yeah. as well. And so those sales have to be, occur on the premises, on the property of that business that's recorded on the FFL. So they, they specified that and, and made they've made uh, dealers aware too. By the way, this may be a point of inquiry where we're going to come, you know, if you continue trying to do business and sell guns during this, we're going to ask you, we're going to basically, at some point, you're going to get inspected. It happens all the time. Every dealer is familiar with ATF inspections. Some of them get them more often than others, but they're going to be asked, how, you know, did you maintain your records properly? Were they stored indoors? That was one thing that was spe specified to this. If they choose to set up a table or something out in front or outside, uh, the, the, they're told they still need to maintain the, the paperwork, the, the documents, the records of the sales, all that inside the business. So meanwhile, you've got uh, Moms Demand Action and Brady Campaign freaking out over this. <laughs> oh, my goodness, drive through gun sales. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rather amused but at that. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I think they'd freak out over anything, right? So <laughs> this is just one other thing to cause them to stay awake at night and scream and holler. Yeah. Well, the Brady campaign called it unsafe and indulgent and then went on to say, we have repeatedly seen the Trump administration put gun industry profits over people throughout the COVID-19 response. Notably by designating gun stores as essential critical infrastructure. Never mind there's this whole, you know, Second Amendment thing. Yeah, that's it, irrelevant, <laughs> though. <laughs> right. All right, let's move on. Uh, uh, did you read this article that uh, our managing editor, Josh Gillum, wrote about gun sales rising, thefts may also rise? I did, I did. Uh, he did a good job. Um, basically, if it, the, the article points out somewhat like what you were talking about. Um, there's still going to be, you know, burglaries and things like that. But because there's so many new gun owners, like literally people are buying guns that have never bought guns before, and they may not be uh, thinking ahead. You know, we all, we've all gone as gun owners through that kind of learning curve where we say, you know, I want the gun, I want to get this and that. And then you realize, well, I need to get a holster. I didn't think about that. And then you say, well, what am I going to do? How do I store it? Okay. I need to get a safe. And, and then, you know, what about in the car? Now, what do I do? I, I don't want to put it in the glove box and just leave it there. So you kind of evolve, right. As a gun owner. And mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of new gun owners. Obviously there are not, I think there are. Um, and so Josh wrote this article and I think it was timely. Um, just kind of some tips and stuff um, about not leaving the gun in the vehicle, um, not n not leaving or putting a bunch of gun stickers and things on your car so, you know, it will be targeted, um, talking about getting safes and things like that because as more guns are out there, the I mean, statistically, the availability is more for, for, for them to be stolen, and that's the last thing you want to have happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, maybe not the last thing, right? You don't want <clears throat> someone to accidentally get it and hurt themselves like a child or something. So, That's right. but it ranks up there, right? I think the key here is, and, and, and I mean, this is why Josh basically wrote this article, is we recognize there's a lot of people buying guns in recent history. Uh, massive, massive increase in the month of March and beginning parts here of April. And, you know, a lot of those are going to be first-time gun buyers and gun owners and... Some people, you know, there's a tendency sometimes, particularly when it's an impulse buy, to just jump in and not really know what you're totally signing up for and not maybe being as educated on the matter as you probably ought to be. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not saying, and I never have said that there should be any sort of education requirement to buy or own a gun. Uh, but 
you know, gun ownership comes with responsibility. And not everybody's as well prepared for this as much as as, as others. And so, you know, this is just our, us doing our part to, you know, Josh wrote this article, put it out there to say, hey, you know, and maybe somebody that just bought a gun stumbles upon this. You know, we actually get quite a few message, messages to, to us and to our Facebook page and stuff that, and, and to the podcast, right? To our podcast uh, hotline, <laughs> <laughs> podcast at concealedcarry.com. We get a lot of emails. People say, you know, <clears throat> I'm so glad I found your podcast because I just became a brand new gun owner or concealed carrier or that sort of thing. And I started searching and trying to find information um, and, and help out there. And I stumbled upon your podcast. Well, the same thing happens with our website. So hopefully somebody, hopefully this article helps somebody out there to begin thinking, okay, my gun's not a safe. Uh, I should take some responsible steps in my home as far as how this gun is stored and kept and all that, particularly if you have children. Mm-hmm. So anyway, we're just, we're really big about being safe. It's, it's an important thing. Yeah. Firearms industry aids in response to COVID-19. This is an article on NRAILA.org. Uh, it's, this is a pretty interesting thing that we're seeing. You know, we're seeing more and more businesses mobilize themselves and even shift gears or uh, reposition themselves to help make critical gear and infrastructure and things uh, to support the response to COVID-19. So this article highlights how Remington Arms, a massive gun maker, right, has offered the use of its manufacturing facilities in New York saying, hey, you know, anything you need us to do, we're here standing at the ready, ready to help. Uh, It doesn't say they're actually doing anything yet, but, but hey, our facilities are here and if you need it, you can have it. Uh, they sent that in a letter to President Trump and to New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, who is not the most gun-friendly person. So perhaps that offer will st- <laughs> will go <laughs> nowhere. Uh, New York has been hard hit, of course we know, by COVID-19. And uh, they, they've said that they're ready to help make, whether it's medical supplies, ventilators, surgical masks, hospital beds, et cetera, et cetera. Coltac, C-O-L-E-T-A-C, a New New Hampshire-based company dedicated to creating the toughest gear for shooting enthusiasts, is now making gowns and masks for a local nursing home. Others in the industry are also doing their part. In fact, I wanted to highlight, and I've I've included in the show notes today of today's episode, uh, two articles. articles. One's actually on Keltec's blog, blog blog.keltecweapons.com, where Keltec is using their 3D printers to print N99 capable masks to supply local hospitals. Uh, so they're using, and, and, and what's cool about this is they've got right there on the site, on their website, uh, the the files, the 3D files uh, for you to be able to go. If you got a 3D printer and you're able to make use of that and support the effort, you can just download these files and bam, start making these things yourself as well. Uh, these are designed to use a common filter, a common HEPA filter uh, used in various uh, like Roomba, you know, vacuums, the little automated robotic whatever uh, vacuums. So pretty cool that you know the the way the industry is adapting to say, hey, we're going to help with the effort. Uh, we, we can make this product and make it compatible to use something else that's also very common. Of course, that may create a, another shortage elsewhere, but how important it is it during this time do you replace your little tiny <laughs> filter in your Roomba? Right. Probably not as critical as, you know, helping healthcare workers like this. So it's pretty cool. So bravo and kudos to Caltech. And also another company that... Uh, us here at concealedcarry.com have a relationship with, and they're a local company to us here in Colorado, uh, Broomfield, Colorado-based Allen Company, an outdoor equipment maker. Uh, we sell some of their products on our site. Uh, in fact, they've, they've been involved in some of our giveaways and things as well. So uh, we really appreciate our relationship with Allen Company and, and uh, everything that they've done to support us. And But they have uh, pivoted, and they are starting to make personal protective equipment, such as masks and gowns as well, instead of gun cases and waders. So just another example of of a gun company, gun industry-related business anyway, uh, to jump jump in and say, hey, we're ready to to help. So pretty cool stuff to see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, In in the article also, it says Beretta is doing something. I don't know. I mean, I know they're in Italy, but I I don't know if it's 
uh, solely helping out in Italy, but I know um, Jam4 Tactical teamed up with a co- couple companies. One's uh, 109 Des- Design. They make T-shirts, and Jam4 Tactical is a uh, holster. And, and with a leather company out there in Abilene, Texas, I can't remember the name of the leather company, but they're also helping out by making um, uh, masks and, and things like that. So it's it's crazy because, you know, if we if you think back, Riley, a couple you know months ago, we were covering stories about how, um, you know, companies wanted to um, make sure that if there were any sort of investments into gun companies that they would withdraw uh, withdraw those investments and invest in other companies as far as stocks and things like that and how you know uh, gun companies uh, are are destroying everything and they're they're evil in nature and and it shows that you know if Governor Cuomo were to turn down uh, the the offer that it's really politics over people, you know, at that point. Um, it, 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 it's, it's crazy because I re, I, if you study World War II and how the country changed during World War II and they stopped making cars, they started making tanks and airplanes and all kinds of different things. I mean, I can't imagine a company or like a, you know, a governor saying, no, we're not going to change our, pro, our plant into a tank making plant because, you know, uh, we're not going to allow that. We're not going to accept that because we're, we're against war or that company, you know, is run by a, a Republican or a Democrat. And I'm the, other. you know, it's just it. I can't imagine that happening. And so I, I hope that all the political stuff that gets put to the side and people just see people for, hey, we want to help. And, and we don't care if you make guns or if you make, you know, Tootsie Rolls. I don't, I don't care if you can help. You help. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah, man. You know, I mean, this is what, honestly, I mean, I could say this is what Americans do, but this is what human beings do, honestly. Yeah. I mean, we, we, human beings are amazing because we are able to critically think. We're able to adapt. We're able to uh, find solutions to big problems. Yes, Americans, we do that. We're, we've been well known for our innovation in in history, you know, responding to certain crises. But, uh, I mean, we are, we're just seeing evidence of that. And, you know, I mean, this is a, crazy terrible pandemic but in a lot of ways it is bring even though we're all more separated than perhaps normal uh it's also bring us together in a lot of ways and I, i've said this before on the on the air and i'll say it again i've been really impressed with the numerous positive messages i've seen on social media as well especially like my my local neighborhood's next door uh group you know on the next door app Mm-hmm. Very, very wonderful, positive things happening there. People being supportive, people offering help, people making masks for other people, help, you know, just picking up groceries for, for elderly, you know, just all kinds of really amazing things. So let's let's keep that going, you know. I mean, this is a great opportunity just to, to recognize that we're all in this together. We're all human beings on this same big old planet. And... Uh, Let's find opportunities where we can help one another. Amen. Uh, turning now to a little less fortunate story, and this one has been rather controversial, I'll add. Um, and I know that we've we've had some people who probably have wanted us to even talk about this. Uh, so I thought, you know, now is now's the time. Even though I'd, I'd almost rather wait a little longer and let a little more information come out in the course of a, a more complete and full investigation. I'm tired of standing by and uh, seeing some of the stuff that's put out there. Um, so this was the Duncan Limp incident in Maryland, you know, last month, about a month ago now, I think. Uh, this was a, initially it was billed as the following. Like what was being reported, especially across social media, was... Red flag, you know, uh, order was served and man got shot in the process by cops. They shot him, you know, while he was sleeping in his bed. It's basically what it went down as. The cops went to do a red flag seizure of guns and shot this guy dead in his, in his bed in, during in his sleep. Well, first of all, anytime I hear something like that, I go, mm, that doesn't quite add up. I mean, <laughs> regardless of what you think of cops, like, it's pretty insane to think that they that they think that they could get away with doing some kind of raid in the early morning hours and that they'll get away with shooting somebody dead in the sleep in bed. 
Like that just never computes. That never makes sense. Like you, you, you can't in today's world, especially in today's world of, I mean, cameras everywhere. Everybody's got a cell phone. I mean, uh, and all kinds of other ways of gathering digital data. Uh, there's just there's just no way that you honestly murder somebody in his bed in his sleep and get away with that as a, as a law, major law enforcement agency. This is Montgomery County Police Department, which is you know pretty. Uh, this is in the uh, you know not too far from Washington D.C. Uh, it's in the Potomac you know area. Um, so Duncan Lemp is a young man who you know we don't still know a ton about, but. Uh, young young guy seems like he's very smart, very intelligent, doing all kinds of things. Uh, you know, stuff with computers and programming and app development and uh, just all kinds of stuff. Um, he had a bunch of guns. I say bunch. I mean, he had uh, like four or five of them. A couple of rifles, a couple of pistols. Uh, some of these were were uh, like Palmer eighty type, you know, Glock kits that you build yourself and and that sort of thing. Apparently, Duncan Lemp was prohibited from owning those, from from owning firearms. Period. Now, what was initially said again that this was some sort of red flag seizure, uh, and then the family attorney came out and they said they're the ones that, you know, this is the family attorney that put out the story that cops showed up and they shot him like it almost seemed like they said that they were implying they shot him through the wall while he was asleep in his bed. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that was a story that was put out there. So instantly you have everybody across social media and YouTube, including some pretty large pro 2A YouTube channels doing videos and pushing memes and stuff out there that, uh, you know, saying that this was a huge travesty. This is, you know, the danger of red flag laws and so forth. And this is what we end up with. Now, to be to be clear, and I am on record of this, I am extremely concerned about red flag laws. All right, uh, I think in in most cases where I've seen these laws be passed, that they are not done appropriately as far as the the protection of due process and other rights. Right, we've talked about this again and again and again to the point of, in my opinion, just exhaustion and people got to be tired of hearing about it. But I thought, you know, well, let's just wait and let's not get emotional about this and let's let the facts come out. So then a few days later, like three or four days later, Montgomery County Police Department releases a statement. And their statement is a preliminary investigation type, you know, statement. Uh, They make it clear that another law enforcement agency, a third party, is investigating this whole thing, which is pretty standard practice. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and in fact, everything will be also reviewed by a separate, again, a separate county's uh, uh, attorney's you know, uh, uh, DA's office, district attorney's office, right? So you have a separate law enforcement agency doing the investigation and also their DA's office will review all of that and go, yep, this was okay or no, there's a problem here, right? Okay. So I know that some are still thinking, well, they're, you know, they're cops, you know, back the blue, protect that thin blue line, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, You know, there's going to be some kind of cover up here. I, You know what? I'm not even going to get into that because I think we still got to let things just shake out a little bit. But if we, if we take this at its word, the, the statement goes that in the early morning hours on March 12th, they served not, this was not a red flag seizure. According to the statement, they were serving a search warrant. That's different than a red flag seizure. It's different, Right. These red flag laws don't come. They're, it's a different process, and not only that, there we learned through the statement that an investigation had been going on for months, months, not just days or weeks, but months. Apparently, now this is where some people say, "Well, hey, there, there's something fishy here," because it said it was an anonymous tip that came in to the to the Montgomery County. Uh, Department of Police that uh, some kind of anonymous tip that said some you know Duncan has guns and he's not supposed to have guns. Mm-hmm. They say that due to some kind of juvenile uh, 
infraction you know, or crime that he was convicted of, uh, that he's prohibited from possessing guns until he's age 30. Now, I've never heard of anything quite like that. I'll be honest with you, Matthew, that you know a, a juvenile would have a specific time frame because uh, they didn't say it's part of like a probation or a parole or anything like that. Yeah. Right. Uh, didn't say whether he was charged as as a juvenile or as an adult, you know, or something for some for something going way back. And so that I don't know. I, I don't know the details of that. All I know is that apparently, based on their laws in the state of Maryland and whatever crime that Duncan Lemp was convicted of, that he was a prohibited possessor of firearms until he's the age of thirty. And so they did an investigation and apparently found enough stuff that said, yeah, we think this is correct. And it wasn't that hard because in a very simple investigation that I performed, I found numerous photos of him with guns, shooting guns, training with guns, involved with some militia groups, et cetera, et cetera. And so if he's a prohibited possessor and he's got these guns, well, he's breaking the law. So over the course of several months of investigation, uh, Montgomery County Department of Police got together a search warrant that they determined they needed to serve in the form of a high-risk search warrant, which, by the way, all these sorts of things had to be approved by a judge beforehand. And so they elected to serve that in the early morning hours on March 12th. And in the course of that, they say that they went in, they identified themselves, that uh, he did not comply with commands, that he even went back into his room, and that when somebody followed him in there that he was grabbing for, reaching, or had a gun, uh, that sort of thing, and so he got shot. Never mind the fact that there's also a booby-trapped uh, entryway. Mm-hmm. So my point here is that things aren't always what they seem to be sometimes, you know, a lot of times, in these, especially in these kind of situations, and that we should let investigations and things like this play out. And then we should look at all the available evidence as far as we can find it and know it and go, does this add up or is there something else here? Before we get all worked up and emotional and start saying how this is some massive red, red flag issue and blow it up into proportions and, and or out of proportions, out of proportion, whatever I'm trying to say, you know what I mean, what I mean, like blowing this thing up into something that it's not. I'm not so convinced where I'm sitting right now, and this may not make me very popular in our community, I don't care. I'm simply looking at the available facts as I know them and weighing what's currently available. And I'm going, Hmm, this family statement from through an attorney of the family who is going to be biased anyway, it, you know, and what he's saying compared to what the, what the police agency at least right now is saying, you know, as of right now, I'm not so sure Duncan Lemp was this innocent martyr of the two A community. Yeah. I, I mean, it, ha- it happens all the time. I mean, on both sides, right? People will get angry and say, why are people rioting when uh, an officer shoots somebody and they happen to be a minority and everybody says, well, it's because, you know, he killed them because he was X race or because he was this or she was this or that and it, it, before anything ever comes out. And so the, the same tendency to get that confirmation bias that, like, I believe all uh, police are racist, or I believe all police are um, tyrannical. Either either one, you, you get that confirmation bias as soon as you hear something, right? And you kind of disregard anything that, that doesn't fall in line with that. And I, I would be, you know, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with calling out police when they are racist or they're totalitarian or whatever, right? When they abuse rights, they should be held accountable. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, we have to, we have to have some, um, some restraint and, and then wait for the facts to come out because nobody really knows. I mean, in this case, I remember reading in what people, it, people were asserting that that happened, that this kid was laying in his bed and he was killed while he was laying in his bed. Um, and it was either an accident or assassination or whatever. There was something shady and you, you didn't hear anything about, you know, a booby trap door or other, other firearms in the home or other people in the home. So I think I'm not, you know, people can say, oh, you guys are licking the boots of police 
police or whatever, that's fine. I mean, that's that confirmation bias, right? Like you don't want to hear what we have to say because you have the, the opinion that um, all police are bad and that's fine. Um, I'm not here to change your mind, um, but we do have to wait for facts because um, I, I know um, a couple, there's other high profile stories about raids and warrants and things like that. And one of them uh, was when a, a woman got killed in a neighboring apartment when police went to serve a, a warrant. And that happened recently. And um, and there was some exchange of gunfire and a woman that wasn't the target in an adjacent apartment ends up dying. And, and they said, well, the police shot her. Well, there were rounds going both ways. And, and as far as I know, there hasn't been any proof one way or evidence that came out to say the rounds that struck and killed this woman came from police versus came from the suspect, right? The person that was shooting at the police when they opened the door and went to go serve the warrant. So I think that yeah. there is, we just need to be prudent and not reactionary so much. Um, and I get it. You know, your heart is like, if police are doing this illegally and stuff like that, they need to be stopped. And I get it. I told, I, I'm right there with you, but we can't, we can't impugn people as a, as a whole based off of something that we don't know the facts on. And I, I would just say, you know, leave it at that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I know that this is all controversial stuff for sure. And yeah. there's a reason for that. These are, these are difficult issues. That's really what this all comes down to. These kind of things are difficult. They're difficult for everybody involved. Uh, I know that, you know, Matt, and I, Matt's, uh, Matt Dalton here, he's on Facebook. He's, you know, we had an exchange a few days ago about these sorts of issues. And, you know, he's, and he's asking, at what point do we tr question police actions? I, we, police are welcome to be questioned all the time. And questions are okay. All right. Or do we just let it be and trust the system? Well, here's the thing. There is a system in place. And so either we, either we abide by that system or we don't. Right. And I don't know what more you can do. I mean, there's probably there probably is things you can do, but how much of it is reasonable? How much of it is actually permissible under the law? I don't know. Uh, I suppose, I suppose it's going to depend on your particular jurisdiction, your state, whatever. But um, as far as how, what what is the practice? Uh, as far as how investigations are handled and things like that. Um, but uh, I mean, to, to the question of so-called no-knock raids, right? High-risk search, search warrants. Um, you want to debate that? Debate that, by all means. I think that they serve a purpose in limited cases. Do I think they're overused? Yeah, I think they are overused, right? Do people do do agencies make mistakes, including especially when serving some of those warrants? Yes, mistakes are made. Should they be held accountable? Yes, they should. And should should full and complete investigations be done? Yes. The questions should be asked. People should be held accountable when mistakes are made. That should be, it should be addressed. It should be handled. Okay. I'm not saying it shouldn't be, but my, 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 the bigger point, all right. And this is what people, some people are missing about this whole situation. This whole issue is that we, it, Duncan Lemp was probably not the innocent little boy that some in our community were trying to paint him to be. And we should let the investigation and the facts come to light and bear out. And once it's all laid to bear, okay, because there will be a full report done on this. The DA's office is going to review it. They're going to release it. They're going to probably do some press conference about it. And when that all happens, we can see it and we can go, does this add up? All right? That's our opportunity. And if there's greater accountability that needs to happen at that time, then that is when that accountability, where we can start pushing for that. But to jump to conclusions before the facts are all out there, that is the wrong thing to do. And that is the point. And that's, now I get off my soapbox. <laughs> so I don't want to hear any more talk about Duncan Lemp until we see this full report, when this investigation is concluded. That's all I'm saying. All right? That's so much to ask. I'm just teasing. <laughs> so, um, all right. Let's see. Now we're to the point where we do gear reviews. I guess my name is first on our outline, so I will go first. Uh, I am doing a little review of the Wilson Combat Grip Module, recently released by them just a few weeks ago or a month ago or so. 
And uh, this is a from the ground up, all new designed uh, grip module. I mean, this is this is not, you know, this is not a Sig Sour product that was reworked and re engraved or stippled or textured or whatever. This is a this is a whole new mold that was used. This is a molded product. So this texture that uh, you will see on the grips of these. Wilson Combat grip modules. This is not laser textured. This is part of the mold. You can tell the just the way it feels, the way it looks. It's a very, very high quality finished look. Uh, it's got the kind of the classic, and really this is what Wilson Combat's known for. If you look at any of their products, you'll see that they have this sort of signature starburst pattern uh, in their grip texturing. Whether it's on their 1911s, whether it's on the Breda grips that they do, whatever, right? So it's got the Wilson Combat Starburst pattern. Uh, it's got a more aggressive, you know, it's got more texture than what the standard P320s have, right? I've got one right here. I know some those of you on the podcast, audio only, can't see this, but just for those that are viewing, and of course you can always go see the videos on our YouTube channel or Facebook page for all the episodes, but you'll see that in the case of Wilson Combat, that grip texture goes up higher up on the grip. I appreciate that. My hand, my support hand, grips there. I get so frustrated with companies that have smooth, basically no texture, where I'm getting a significant amount of pressure from my support hand bearing down on that grip. So uh, they've got you know the more grip texture goes up you know, covers a great a larger uh, grip area uh, there are less spots where there's no texture present and that's good the back straps and front straps is a fine but you know fairly aggressive not not overly aggressive it's not the sort of thing that's going to really abrade your hands unnecessarily it's it, it just gives you a nice good grippy texture on the front and back straps of the pistol and then again that texture on the side is a little bit different uh, with the starburst pattern i would say looking at this grip module comparing it to things like well here's here's an x carry grip module which actually you'll see so so to be fair the x series grip modules on the p320 series pistols uh they they did do some things i think that were an improvement right so the texture on the sides of the grip does go up higher than it does on the original 320 grips right uh, they made the X series a, a little more square, a little bit more rectangular, where the sides are f flat, as opposed to rounded like the original P320 grip modules have. Uh, some people prefer this. Some people prefer the original. All right. Now, what's interesting about this Wilson Combat one is it's sort of a marrying of the two. It, it, this is this honestly the best way to describe it is the Wilson Combat grip module is sort of a combination of the X-Series grip and the original P320 grip all in one. So you get some of the features available on the out of the old grip, and some people will probably appreciate that more rounded feel to it. And But you, then you also bring over some things from like the X-Series as well that I think are beneficial. It's going to feel a little bit slimmer in your hand, and in fact, this will be one of my one complaints about this. Uh, I'm not sure I'm super crazy about this aspect. I think some some shooters probably will like this. But the grip is fatter in the front. So when we look at the front strap and we look at the back strap, the front strap is perceptibly th thicker. It, it fills the hand more. The back strap is thinner. Hmm. And I don't know why they went that route, but it it's not my favorite. It's not terrible, okay? There's enough other good stuff going on about this grip module that I like it, okay? Uh, it shoots fine, but where I like to get a lot of support hand contact and kind of that rear quarter panel of the grip, that part of the grip's thinner. So it's harder to get some of that contact that I normally like to try to try to get and feel. So that was not my, that's probably, that. that is honestly, I think overall this is a winner of a grip module. I think it's a fantastic grip module. I think it's extremely well done. It looks good. Uh, the finish and, and fit and everything is perfect. There's nothing to complain about there whatsoever. But 
that thinness in the back strap in the kind of that quarter panel. I don't know how else to describe it other than kind of like quarter panel. It's just, it's kind of that rear. Like if you're if you were looking down at the pistol from above, where the barrel the muzzle is at twelve o'clock, we're talking basically seven o'clock and five o'clock on the grip. If that makes sense, right? In those areas, it's just it's thinned out a little bit. It's not my favorite, but overall, everything else feels really nice. One final thing, the uh, magwell is funneled. In fact, the base of the magwell sort of reminds me of the new Gen 5 Glocks, where it's flared out a little bit, but it's 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 a little bit more than that. It's a little bit more aggressive, and the actual uh, funneling. Okay, so this this this. Magwell is actually very usable. It is very generous. It's very easy to get a uh, mag in the mag well of the gun uh, on a mag change. All right. So right now this is a, this is the kind of the full size Wilson Combat Grip module, meaning it, it this this is designed to work with the 17 round magazines or bigger. Uh, my understanding is they're coming out with a compact version as well. It'll be shortened down a little bit for 15 round capacity. But overall, I've been very impressed. I like it. It feels good, shoots good. Well done, Bravo, Wilson Combat. It's, it's cool to see other options on the market for pistols like the P320, and that's one of the really amazing things about the 320 series is just how modular it is and how easy they make it for manufacturers to offer aftermarket products like this. Hey, you don't like the thing you got on your gun? Well, pretty much anything on the 320s can be changed out. There's aftermarket slides, aftermarket barrels, aftermarket sights, aftermarket grip modules, aftermarket triggers. I mean, like everything except for that fire control unit, right? Which is essentially that's the serialized sort of frame part of the gun. Cool. There you go. Well, that's good. Review. If you like it, I mean, that's uh, that's saying a lot because I know you're you're very particular in types in those types of things. So very cool. Um, all right, so for mine, uh, Riley, if you heard him earlier, he said what it is, but it's this Pig Lube range kit right here. If you see it on, if you're uh, watching us on Facebook or YouTube, if not, um, it's just this kit. It's probably, I don't know, four, five, maybe five, six inches by four inches, um, and it has this nice case, but you know, the reason why I picked this is, you know, I, I said this earlier, I normally pick something that's new that I just got and I'm kind of working through, but this thing, I mean, I, everybody needs to clean their firearms and, and this kit comes with me every time I go to the range, it's small, it's compact. And inside when you open it up, um, you have, you know, bore brushes, you have chamber brushes, picks, um, you, there, there's, uh, one, two, let's see, three, six, there's, uh, seven different rods that you can get. And I think, I, I, I think it's, it can go up to 35 inches when you put it all together. So you could get it through an, you know, a rifle and AR, um, it has a chamber flag for, you know, for an AR. So you can, you can put it in there while you're cleaning. Um, it has patches, comes with pig lube, which I love pig lube. Um, not just because it smells good, but because it works really well. Um, but in such a small small you know little compact kit you can throw it in your bag and it's always there and i really like it, it has some extra space in there you can throw like a boar snake if you want to put something extra in there um but I, I hate you know sometimes you buy those those cleaning kits and they're huge right and it's this big hard case like a pelican case type thing and I just like this because it's small. It's really compact. It's well thought out. There's stuff in there that you need. Throw it in your bag, and it's always there. And I've used it a bunch of times out on the range. So, yeah, that's it. Same yeah. here, man. And it's bacon scented, Matt. So, yeah. You know, I, I just was cleaning my Glock 19 yesterday, uh, getting ready for shop talk, and uh, I had I had my the same kit sitting out on the mm -hmm. on the on the bench. So. Uh, or at least parts from it. I think I pulled a couple things out of it, but uh, yep, it's a great kit, handy to take to the range with you for sure. So thanks for your review of that, Matthew. And so that is what we call industry news and gear reviews. That brings us to the end, the conclusion of our episode. Hey guys, make sure you check out the Shooter Ready Challenge, shooterreadychallenge.com, and uh, be sure to join in and participate with us there. You have the chance to win free ammo. And uh, plus, just get better as a shooter, as a concealed carrier. And that those are all good things. 
Also, uh, laserapp.com, L-A-S-R-A-P-P.com is the place to go to learn more about the Laser App software, including their Laser X version. In fact, you can get directly to that link at laserapp.com forward slash L-A-S-R-X. And the Laser App software pairs very well with the uh, Cert Pistol from Next Level Training nextleveltraining.com. So if you don't have a cert pistol, I mean, many of you probably do, but if you don't, I always recommend having one. I, I, I like it. You know, it's just so easy to, to use for various dry fire uh, purposes. So cert pistol, get one. And, and the cool thing is I was talking about 320, right? Well, they now have the 320 model available in the cert pistol line. So you got Glocks, basically. You, you know, they don't say they're Glocks, but, uh, you know, that's that's what they are. They have the, the Model 110 series, which is the Glock. They have the SIG MMP uh, lineup, and they've got the P320 lineup now. And also the the compact or micro-compact, they, they call it the pocket pistol model, the CERT pocket pistol. So all kinds of great options available there. NextLevelTraining.com. All right. Well, we're going to let you go. We wish you all the best, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again later this week on Thursday. We actually have a special interview with attorney Derek DeBros. Uh, we'll talk about some uh, some legal issues. It'll be it'll be fun. I mean, this is not meant to uh, replace Andrew Branca or anything like that. Just just getting another perspective and somebody else that's very knowledgeable and has actually represented clients in various cases as well. So it'll be fun talking with Derek on Thursday. We look forward to it. So until then, stay tuned, and a reminder to train right, train often, and train safe so you can fight hard, fight fast, and fight true. And I forgot about the giveaway. <laughs> I was just going to say that. So, Matthew, why don't you pull it up for us? I got it right now. <clears throat> Do you happen to know what we're giving away? Anybody? I think this Anybody? week is the, oh, well, you can, you can have the viewers guess, but, uh, you know, with the delay and everything, we'll be waiting a moment. Mm, I got it. $50 gift card SSPI wear, correct? Absolutely, yep. $50. It's <clears throat> so one of my favorite giveaways that we do. It, yeah, it, it is a really good one. Um, so, okay, so I'm picking the window right now. The first name is oh, Hold Matt. on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, oh, oh. oh you're just too quick. <laughs> Drum roll. All right, so the winner is Matt. Uh, last name starts with an S. You have a cox.net email address. It uh, starts with a C and has a 25 in it. So C25 That's okay. at cox.net. You don't, you don't have to give away all the secrets there. But you will receive an email. <laughs> but what I can tell you is it's not, it's not Matt Dalton. <laughs> no, unfortunately, no. <laughs> but we will email you. Congratulations, Matt. <laughs> So, congrats, Matt S., winner of a $50 gift card, SSP Eyewear. It's one of my favorite giveaways because, uh, hey, you know, give the gift of eye protection. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a good thing. And you know what? 50 bucks goes quite a, quite a ways. Uh, you know, I, I highly recommend you put that towards, uh, if Matt was listening, highly recommend you put that towards the Matt Howe kit. Mm. It won't cover the full price. So that's the one thing, like... I think it'll fifty bucks will cover just about anything uh, on SSP Eyewear's uh, website, but the Metal Kit not quite. So, but it'll get you on the way to that. I saw somebody on YouTube. He you wanted a shout out. Well, fine. I will give you a shout out. Ray Mark Ballesteros. Ballesteros. He says, "Can you read my comment? Shout me out, bro." Hey, <laughs> hey. Well, there you go. <laughs> Did I amuse you? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you ask really good questions or make insightful comments, you have a, a greater chance of being featured on the podcast. That's just the way it goes. Matt says, at least SIG sells optic cut slides as a standard, unlike an upgrade like Glock Perfection. Ha ha. What about the Glock MOS guns? Those are optic cuts, and those are, they're not standard on every model, but neither are SIGs. This one's not, you know. Oh. I just realized I never switched back. We're just looking at Matthew the whole time. I feel oh, terrific. Still, um, I was still focused on comments. This doesn't <laughs> have an optics cut. At the same time, the gun that I'm carrying on my person, which I'm not going to pull out of the holster right now, it does have an optics cut. Anyway, are you not entertained? <laughs> oh, and l- let me just add this in for everybody who's still listening. Next week's uh, giveaway 
is going to be the door ambush uh, course. Digital, oh, nice digital copy. So, well, good. Yeah. Uh, door copy of the door ambush DVD. So, we'll send you one of those. Make sure you sign up. Uh, let's see, concealedcarry.com forward slash podcast prize. That's that's where to do it. <laughs> well, guys, we appreciate all your support. Appreciate you being here with us uh, week after week after week, episode after episode. So, until next time, we'll sign off. We'll let you go. Y'all take care. And put in some time. Do some dry fire. It'll be good for you. Matt, have you been doing your dry fire? I have. I have. Good for you. All right. Toodaloo. We'll see you.